Siddiqin, Shuhada Salihin. You know, the Prophet, of course, is sealed. And now, who are the, like, and people could be Shuhada, they could be the, the righteous. What was Siddiq? Is it like the big people at the beginning gave birth to the Prophet? As Siddiqin, like As Siddiq means someone who has strong, firm Iman. They could still exist today, tonight? Without a doubt. So Insha'Allah It's not It's no restriction Shuf Shuf Allah tells us in the Quran Surah Al-Nisa You obey Allah And His Rasul Fa'ulaika Ma'aladheena anam Allahu alayhim Mina nabiyyin Wa siddiqeen Wa shuhadai Wa salihin Ha Wa hasana ulaika Rafiqa Dhalika al-fintai Al-muhim What's important here Is that and Nabiyin, we have specific texts stating that there aren't any left. And there are no to, there are none to come. Period. As far as other things, Allah didn't put a restriction on him. Nor did his Rasul. He called him Khatim and Nabiyin. La Nabi Abadi. No prophet after me. Allah says the seal of the prophets. Period. But there's nothing more than that with regards to the Salihin. And every time and every place there's Salihin. Al Jihad, the Prophet mentioned it will continue. It won't stop. The last of my nation, the last of my fathers will fight. So, someone dying in the lost cause it won't stop. The ulama, some ulama say the shuhada. The main interpretation is the shuhada, yani shaheed, man shaheed al ma'araka. Was actual martyr on the battlefield, dying in Allah's cause. That's going to continue. Okay, as Siddiqeen, there's no specific restriction on that. But only Allah knows who's a Siddiq and who isn't. And we've been told about some of them. And from them is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He believed the Prophet sallam. He affirmed. He acknowledged what the Prophet told them before anyone else did. This one, the Quraysh, this pagan, this one. He may have had some doubt. He, the Siddiq. And also, he's also truthful as well. فَهَذَا غَيْرُ محصور. That's not something that's restricted. That's not what? Restricted. Right, restricted. So someone being Salih, someone being a Siddiq, and so on and so forth, that is with Allah. Only Allah knows. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ huh? Huh? Allah. He knows those who are ضَلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ and those who have guidance. Allah knows best. And the yardstick of Salah and a person having this Siddiq and being a martyr is kitab and sunnah. Kitab sunnah is mine. It's not what type of robe you got on, what type of turban you're wearing, your lineage, where you come from, that pit, that no kitab and sunnah. If you're practicing kitab and sunnah, Allah and the awliya Allah, la khufun alayhim, wa la hum yahzanun. Allah dina amanu, kanu yatakhun. Anyone who believes in Allah and has taqwa is a wali of Allah. Period. And among the awliya of Allah are obviously their what? Levels. Levels. Those who have Iman and Taqwa are not like those who have Iman and Taqwa and have a great amount of ilm. Those who have a great amount of ilm are not like those who teach them. And then those who teach and make jihad and this and this and give sadaqah and their righteousness and their practice. Hunak darajat. Hunak what? Levels. The levels. So what are they Wallahu ta'ala alam. I've never come across something that restricts a Siddiq to a time or place. Like that of the what? Nibigin. We clearly mention seal. Well, so, the judgment, a person can be above the shuhada even if he didn't become more like he has to that state. Ab above the shuhada, cave, yani. By something. Cave uh, above the shuhada. Like for the Asad Nabi, who are the second highest in ranks? Hmm. The king or the shuhada? Sure. First and foremost, that I right there. Right. It's not saying that who's above one another. All right. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they are yani, uh, in order as well. Oh. Some of the prophets died as well and were martyred, were killed. Oh. The, Jew, the, the Jews, the Christians, Ahl al Kitab, specifically the Yahud, they killed the Nabiyin. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Now, also, they are Salihin as well. They're righteous. And also Siddiqin, they believed in what was given to them. But it's different terminology. It's different what? Oh, so I, I said this person here, huh? He's a tough guy. That doesn't mean that he's dumb. In many cases, oftentimes it is, but it doesn't mean that. But the the yani the the most or the the most obvious thing about him, his strong point is strength and being tough. 
Doesn't mean that he has no smarts. He's a scholar. Doesn't mean that he can't fight. He can't defend himself. He's an athlete. Doesn't mean that he's what? Void of studies. Many people that go to the to the the, the, the professional sports leagues, NBA, NFL, and they're also are very educated. But the stereotype is that his athlete is what? He's dumb. He's a jock. But you find some that have very good grades. And not just from, you know, they actually they, they studied as well. But that's not what he's called. They call him a what? An athlete. So the Nabi, that's the greatest of his attributes. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have righteousness. Doesn't mean that he's not a Sadiq. Doesn't mean that he's not a God. That doesn't mean that. Everybody understands? Doesn't mean what? Doesn't mean that. And there's a difference between the words being mentioned together and then being mentioned what? Separately. Every Nabi is going to be Salih. Taban. But every Salih is not what? A, a Nabi. No, Clear on this? No. Allah Alam. Can I say Omar Allah was Sadiq or no? They can't say that. Yeah, Umar Because he should, uh, the, the Prophet, Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he mentioned abundantly his virtues. What he was, how he lived, we know how he died, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is the best of the Sahaba after Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. From khalas. What more could you want? Siddiq radiallahu anhu was mentioned as Abu Bakr. Doesn't mean Abu Umar is not a Siddiq. Once again, does it what? It doesn't, mean no doesn't mean that, no. But that was the attribute and that was the term given to oh. Abu Bakr. And Umar radiallahu anhu was called Al Faruq. That doesn't mean that Abu Bakr Siddiq wasn't Faruq as well. Abu Bakr Siddiq fought the, uh, the apostates. He established Islam. He held Islam down when people were starting to leave and things were happening after the Prophet's death. And he did what? Put his hand down, put his fist down. I will fight them if they keep back one sheep. For me, that they used to give to Muhammad. Allah Akbar. Listen to that. How resolute he was. And Umar radiallahu anhu didn't agree in the beginning. He didn't agree. How can you fight him and say, La Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah? And Abu Bakr mentioned the hadith, mentioned the delil, so on and so forth. So that, that's Furqan. He separated the haq from the batil. With his words verbally and also with the what? Be safe, not actions. Cold steel. Separated the haq from the batil. La, no doubt about that. And Umar radiallahu anhu is called Farooq. So it doesn't mean that uh, Umar uh, wasn't a Siddiq and Abu Bakr wasn't Farooq. But that was the what? The Aywa. It's the thing that was given to him, his special characteristic, his special, special feature that became known, that became obvious, that he became strong in his speciality. Everybody understand this? But Umar radiallahu anhu, no doubt, he believed in the Prophet. And he accepted the Prophet and the things that people started to reject. And he reinforced the Rajim, stoning the death of the fornicator. He gave the, he gave the khutbah. He told the people, it's in the book of Allah. And a time will come in which the people will say, it's not in the haq. Indeed, we, we made Rajim. We stoned people in the time of the Prophet. That's Siddiq. He's affirming, he's believing, his Iman is strong. So it doesn't, one, one attribute doesn't negate the what? Hadawa. Wallahu alam. Follow. Like, every time there's a lot of parents who, like a lot of youths right now, are becoming, come to deen, and the parents, they weren't in that particular field, rather they were born in a certain way. They were, they were raised in a certain way. But they don't want their sons to go seek Islamic knowledge. And also, they do things which are against Islam totally. And, and some of these things leads to disobedience in terms of very high disobedience in terms of they stop talking to the parents they don't want to deal with the parents and, and these bid'a and these injustice Tire. what in that terms is it going to be the fact that the hadith says so on righteousness or seeking knowledge or both in terms of um, children being righteous trying to practice children trying to be practiced. follow the sunnah so on and so forth. And on top of that, the parents, for example, they're doing, committing injustice against other people. For example, a parent may be arrogant. They think his color or his kind is better than the black or the white. And the son is like, you know what? I don't want to yes. talk to you unless you change. Right. Treat the parents kindly, as we just read. Period. Muslim or kafir. Obviously, you do not obey them in disobedience to Allah. As the Prophet says, 
He says obedience is only in that which is ma'roof, that which is good, and obedience to Allah and His Rasul. No disobe no obedience to the Khalid or the Creator, and that which entails disobedience, huh? No, excuse me, no obedience to the creation. La ta'ata li makhluqin fi ma'asiyatil khaliq. No obedience to be shown and given to a created being, a human, a parent, a mother, a father, a sheikh, a military general, if it entails disobedience to Queen. the creator of those people. That's what I wanted to say. Step of the tongue, obviously. So therefore, and there are many, many proofs that support this. So, you obeying your parents is one thing. Has nothing to do with kind treatment of your parents. If your parents are racist, why the yadu billah? Your parents could be racist pigs. It's a reality. Bengali, black racist, Indian racist, Pakistani, Guyanese, whatever. Prejudice, racist, and all different cultures and factions and colors. La hawla wa la illa billah. West Africans, racist against black Americans. Black Americans, prejudice against West Africans, for example. South Africans, they know better than the East Africans. Oh Allah, jahiliyyah, yani. Jahiliyyah. Your parents could be filthy racists. That doesn't mean that you don't treat them kindly. You don't obey them in that. You don't have to listen to that. You do not condone that. You advise them. You give them nasiha. You enjoy the good, but that has nothing to do with you, your treatment of them. So if your mother's a racist, why the other way lie? She talks about your friends. Why you bring him over here? He's this, he's that, he's ugly, he's dirty, he's black, he's white, he's whatever, he's yellow, he's red. That doesn't mean that you still don't have to serve your mother. And you still don't have to treat your mother kindly. As long as you do not obey her in disobedience. You do not condone her jahiliyyah. Everybody understand this? Or her oppression. You like to say arrogant. Riba. Things like this. But the concept of good treatment is absolute. Obedience is restricted. As we said as what? You have to only obey them. And that which is obedience to Allah and His Rasul. And that which is not haram. Which that which doesn't go against Kitab and Sunnah, you have to obey them in that. Okay? As far as not talking to your parents and boycotting your parents, a person should never ever do that. Never. Because a person is supposed to treat his parents kind, even if they're mushrikun. Allah says, When jahadaka, if they fight you to make shirk with me, that which you have no knowledge of, do not obey them. Treat them kindly, so on and so forth. So therefore, the concept of obeying them is what we clarify that. Now, kind treatment, clarify that. Can you boycott your parents? Why do you boycott a person? You boycott a person for one or two reasons. The first reason in Islam, and many people they misunderstand the concept of boycotting, Hajar. They don't understand why. Let alone they're hasty. Let alone they boycott people be ready to oftentimes, most times. You boycott a Muslim for one or two reasons. Number one is let alone a kafir. We're talking about Muslims first. Is to punish that person in order for him to come back to the deen. We see you drinking alcohol, so we stop speaking to you. Dang, Mufti doesn't speak to me no more. He doesn't answer my phone. He turns, he walks away from me. This going to break my heart. And you know why he's doing it. He saw me with the bottle. Let me get rid of the bottle. That's a mercy to your brother. And the second concept of boycotting someone is to protect yourself from someone's evil, such as an actual innovator that's calling to innovations and spreading innovations, not a student of knowledge that has better grades than you. Huh? Not somebody who's memorized the Quran and you haven't. Not someone who you're jealous and you're envious of. Not a person of Sunnah that's teaching and spreading and benefiting the people and you're too weak and feeble to do so and you're envious. None of, that's, none of that crap, as the people say today. Not somebody that made a mistake, but he's still a person in Sunnah. No, no, no. Mubtadir. Innovator. Calling to bid'ah. Promoting bid'ah. The proof has been established upon that person. He's, so that's a different story. You boycott that person because he's spreading doubts. He's spreading evil. No doubt about that. So we have Al-Hajr al tadibi and Al-Hajr al wiqai Protecting yourself. And punishing someone. The purpose of punishing the person is not just to punish, but to do what? Mm. Bring them back. And a person of protection is a person who you lose hope in. Or you don't have the ability 
to convince them and speak with them, you stay away from that person because he's evil. He's evil. He's calling people to innovations or kufr or shirk or anything else. He's calling people to fisk. Anything that's against Allah and His Rasul. Are you right, this? So your parents, how can you treat them kindly if you boycott them? How can you treat them kindly if you boycott them? And what sin could be worse than shirk? And the law still said what? And not only are they mushriks, he says, when jahadaka, if they fight you and struggle against you to make shirk, still treat them kindly. Allah Akbar. Everybody understand this? Your mother's calling you to shirk. Not just she's a mushrik, she's fighting you, trying to make things hard for you to be a mushrik like her. You still have to treat her kindly. So therefore, a person should not book out his parents. There may be an extreme situation, an extreme case, something really extreme happens that's so bad. Or a person has to get away from his parents. That's one thing. Or his father does something that's totally sick. This this unbearably repulsive and reprehensible. That's an extreme situation, perhaps. But if that's not the case, you don't boycott your parents. Give them advice, give them a siha. And like many people today are not going to listen, unfortunately. And they're just going to continue to be ignorant and practice the Islam that they want to practice. There's nothing you can do. Make dua for them. But you cannot allow your parents to influence you to follow their jahili ways. Oh, shave your beard. You don't have to have a beard. Our sheikh back in Bangladesh said that a beard is not mandatory. Not sorry. Sorry, Umi. I love you, but I can't listen to you. I love you, but I can't go and listen to the sheikh that's lying on Allah and his rasul. This jahil. He's just talking out of the side of his neck. He don't know what he's talking about. Mawla fulan. Malish. But you want some water on me? I massage your feet. Food, clothes, money. You want to go here? Marhaba. Listen to this jahil mufti? I can't help you. You give her advice. Don't listen to that person on me. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have ilm. He's not with the sunnah. Everybody understand this? She says, listen to him. Trim your beard, shave your beard. Sorry. Be nice, be kind. Be, give her a kiss, give her a hug. Change the subject, avoid the topic. If she doesn't want to listen, she doesn't listen to what you say, don't even bring up the topic of the beard. But the moment she says, cut your beard, you can't, you can't obey her. The moment she brings in this jahid guy talking about this and that, bidah. Sorry. Everybody understand this? So many parents, they want to get them to practice their jahili ways. Or you want to be a student of knowledge, but your parents want you to be a doctor, or an engineer, or a lawyer, or this and that. And you want to seek in. You know that that's what makes you feel happy. That's what makes you feel a better Muslim, let alone the, the benefit of ilm. And they force you, and they make things hard for you. Your father says, I'm not going to give you no money. I'm not going to take care of you because you don't want to listen to me. That's the sacrifice that you have to make. And that's the life that you chose, and you have to take the things that come with that lifestyle. Everybody understand this? But it doesn't mean you have to be nasty and disrespectful to him. He asked you to take out the trash, take the trash out. Trim the, uh, the mow the lawn, mow the lawn. Go to the store, you go to the store. But go to college and be a doctor, you don't have to obey him in that. You what? You don't have to obey him in that. And not only does, does he not need your service, he's, he's, he lives a normal life, he's not sick, he doesn't need you to be there. If you come to the house, son, can you do this? He's trying to get you away from the what? The masjid and the deen. You don't, you don't fall for that trick as well. And it happens very often. And many parents, they do this in a slick way. They'll get sick. They'll fake sick. They'll act sick. They'll do this. Oh, son. Oh, son. But if you were a beard shaver, if you had on tight pants, if you were running up and down the street chasing girls, drinking and laughing and partying, or not even a sinner, just living a normal life, a normal Muslim life, they'll be fine. You know, this is a reality. This is a sad reality. And then Allah tells us that, Yani, from your wives, from your children, those who are enemy to you. Allah clearly states this in the Quran. They could be an enemy. Ah, fahda, Allah says, beware of them. So this is a sad reality. And this is advice to the students of knowledge. If you want to study, it's not always going to come on a bed of roses or a silver platter. And everybody's not going to agree with you. Rather, when you go to see Ilm, a lot of people are going to disagree with you. And hate you for no other reason except that you're choosing the righteous path. Allah Akbar. Or it could be envy. They're envious that you're righteous, you're upright, you're steadfast, and I'm not. You think you're better than us? You think you're sheikh now? 
We're all going to the hellfire. Sound familiar, right, Sheikh? You used to have a shaven face too. Now you have a beard. So you're you're a scholar now? You're Jesus now? They make fun of you. Why the other Billah? So you're not to listen to them and you're not to obey them. Now, Respect your father. Respect your mother. But if they do not need your specific service, go travel. And beware of the tricks of shaitan. Now there's events where mother says to the son, the daughter, son especially, if she mar if he marrying a different kind, I'll kill myself. Right. Oh. That's not your sin. That's not your that's not your responsibility. That's from shaitan. You don't have to obey that. How are you gonna kill yourself if I marry a different race? Obviously it's best to please your mother if you can. And if you can find a good girl, a religious girl that's pretty, attractive, she's a good and she's from Bangladesh, that's best. That's best, inshallah. And Allah knows best, but perhaps that's best. Okay, but if you don't find that, or if you find a girl from another race, another nationality, another color, whatever the case may be, that makes you happy, and she's pious, and she's righteous, and your parents are not willing to accept that, Allah must time. What can you do? What can you do? And that's not, that's not ma'roof. That's jahiliya. That's nothing but jahiliya. No marry someone from Pakistan. Don't marry someone from India Only Bangladesh And not even from all Bangladesh Just this part of Bangladesh The north or the south Capital Kata, Kata. That's Jahiliya There's nothing more than Jahiliya Oh no A different culture You're not going to be able to get, agree with them You're not going to be able to live with them With the children Your language The food That is Kulluhu Batil Kalam Faldi It's false and there are people trying to disguise and color their jahiliya. Many people, they do this. Practicing Muslims. They may be on a sunnah, but they still what? Jahiliya. Still there, as the Prophet tells us. They're still going to be there. So they're not just outward racist or our biggest, our prejudice. We won't say we hate people from India, but it's still what? It's still there. Oh, well, you know, she's from India. It's different. And how? Together. 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 At the end of the day, She's Indian and she's not Bengali. That is the reason why. Nothing else. She prays. She wears jab. She's beautiful. She's a jab. What's the mushkila? She has a good family. Nothing bad about her that we know about her family. But she's from? Mm. India. She's not from Bangladesh. Jahiliya. So many people, they disguise their Jahiliya. Huh? Or somebody could be honest. Son, I think you should marry somebody from your own kind. Perhaps it's easy for you. Maybe. Kalo kalo. But most people know it's actually Jahiliya. And marriage in Islam, love in Islam, it doesn't know no color or, or language. That's, as I said, love is blind. You can find someone from a different part of the world, different country, that could be a better wife than you, than a girl that's from your family. Your third or fourth, fifth cousin. No doubt about that. The one who speaks your language, who eats your food, who wears your clothes, who knows your jokes, she could be a terrible wife. And a woman from another hemisphere could be the best wife that you have. So that's the bottom line. In the akramakum and the light at Best of you to Allah are those who have the most taqwa. The best wife is the woman that's obedient. She's loving to her husband, affectionate to her husband. She respects her husband. She never forgets Allah. That's the best wife. Whether she's from China, whether she's from Zimbabwe, whether she's from uh, Guyana, whether she, whatever she looks like, which kind, that's the best wife to have. And that's the woman that's going to make you happy, and you're going to sleep good at night, you're going to feel good when you wake up, when you go to your house, when you leave your house, she's going to give you good, righteous children. As far as the one that is the picture perfect wife from your culture, like this and like that, and she doesn't have taqwa, she doesn't have iman, she's not a pleasing woman, she's going to make your life miserable. And know one thing for sure, your parents are not going to be there when you have to go to sleep miserable. You have to go to sleep at the end of the night, rolling over, turning away from her. Oh, blah. another night with this lady, this woman, so on and so forth, or this brother, same opposite, same applies. This husband, she doesn't like the husband. She's not attracted to him. He has no ilm, no taqwa. He beats her. He disrespects her. Her parents, they're not with her when she has to live with that man. So the parent gives advice. He nurtures his child. He instructs. But you can never ever force your child to do something that they don't want to do. And as we said in the class, 
not only is that wrong, but it's not going to bring any barakah in it. It's not going to bring the fruits that you want. This doctor that you want is not going to be who you want him to be because his heart is not there. His soul is not there. I'm not happy being a doctor. I want to be a student of knowledge. I want to be a sheikh. I want to be an alim. I don't want to be no sitting on desk. It's not what I want to be. So, yeah, I need parents. And Allah understand. And Allah guide them to, to see Islam first and foremost and see common sense. Mm -hmm. Common sense. Yeah, I need, do you want your son to be happy or you want to be happy? What are my friends going to say? What are my family members going to say? He married someone from India. Oh, but he's happy. He's praying. He's making salah. He has righteous children. What, what matters? Allah and His Rasul. Your son being happy or those jahil backbiting women. That's what they are. Backbiting women. No gossip. Me riba. Oh, he's saying, Fulan, Fulan. Shufian, Shufian. Yeah, he married a woman from India and this and that. Oh, this, that's what's more important to you. It's very sad. Nothing. And that person is not to be given that type of respect. You do not take the advice of a fool. And there lies no doubt. A person who knows something is wrong. I know something doesn't make sense, and he continues to follow it. Is a what? They're fools. Even if it's your parents, they're fools. Unfortunately. One last question, which is, can let's say a husband is married to a girl, a girl, and the girl's mother is always butting in the family of the husband and daughter, and the husband don't want that, to, and the husband says, listen, you shouldn't do that, and the mother-in-law says, I'll do whatever, I'll be butting in. You can't do anything about it. Like, is that impermissible? Like, can the mother-in-law be budding in all the time in family matter of the husband? That's improper Islamically. Mm -hmm. Minding your business is from the Sunnah. Giving people their space is also from the Sunnah. How did the Prophet deal with his the daughters, his sons, his relatives, his in-laws, this one, that one? Did he butt in with the Sahaba? and control them and dictate their lives. He never did that. He taught them what was halal or was haram. They came to him asking him a question, he gave them the ruling and that was it. He never dictated to them how they should live their lives and what they can and cannot do. He never did that. And he's the best example for all of us. So therefore, a person can give advice. If there's a problem that's brought to you, you can give advice, give counsel. All right, everybody in a sense, arbitrator. But for you to mind your biz other people's business, let alone bud in, dig in, interfere. Not only is that not Islamic, but that's going to cause major chaos. Your daughter, your son, your son-in-law is going to cause hatred. They're not going to like you. They're not going to go to you when they should go to you. Everybody, everybody understand this? They're not going to seek your counsel when it is good to seek your counsel because you're always budding in our business. You always give us bad advice. You always take your son's side against me. You always listen to your daughter and you don't listen to me. It's not going to bring no khair. So that is un Islamic. That's first and foremost. Secondly, that's harmful, worldly, in a way. Among Jews and Christians, it's going to bring harm in the marriage. It's going to bring malice. It's going to bring mutual hatred. And if you don't like your father in law, your mother in law, know for sure it's going to prevent all types of good and it's going to bring all types of bad. Because it may be a situation said that you, you need to go to your father-in-law. You need his advice. But because you hate him, he's such a bad person, he's messed up your marriage so much, you want to say what? I'm not going to him, man. And that's bad. So therefore, that, that person has to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give them their space. Your son is not a boy anymore. He's a grown man. Sexually mature and active. He's not the little small boy. That you used to play around with and wash up in a bathtub on a baby thing with no tear shampoo. He's a grown man making ghusl janaba. Everybody understand the difference? He's a grown man. And that's a part of growing up as a parent as well. As you have to realize that your child is no longer a little kid. It's a hard thing upon parents sometimes. That little small little baby boy and girl used to wash up and have fun with and play with. And he's, he's gone. He's 10 now. He's 12. I want to go play basketball, Abby. I want to go to the park with my friends. I want to do this. I don't want to sit and read the little story anymore. And I don't want to sit and watch cartoons. No, 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 no. You have to accept that. Give the child a space. Give the child a space. Let alone 16, 18, 25, 30 years old, 40 year old. Man. Something's wrong. And it happens among many people. So therefore, the best thing that you can do is be patient upon that person. 
Seek Allah's protection. Seek Allah's refuge. Ask Allah to help you. But you gotta have sabr because there's no no situation that's perfect. No marriage is perfect. The girl is righteous, but her parents. All these things have to be taken consideration to imagine. No one is perfect, and this is why people say in-laws are the worst. Unfortunately, people they lie on you, they'll backbite you. There's gossip, trying to spread your secrets, butting, interfering in your relationship. At the end of the day, my advice would be is that the stronger your relationship is, the better your foundation is with you and your wife, the less they'll have the ability to butt in. But if your wife and you are a bit distant and separate, there's going to be problems. But if you and your wife truly know each other and love each other and work together, or you and your wives, because we have to stop, we have to get out of that too as well. The Christian way of thinking. Even the way we say it. That, that, that Christian way. Me and my wife, me and my wife, me and my wife. Man can have more than one wife in Islam. Okay? You and your wives. But for, for argument's sake, one wife. The stronger you are with each other, the less interference from outside. And the weaker you are with each other, the more interference. But if you and your wife are tight, and she knows that what happens in this household stays in this household. First and foremost, Islam. Let alone just my husband, my friend. I can't betray him. I don't tell his secrets. His faults. His flaws, his shortcomings that are hidden from the people are to remain between me and him, and that's it. Not even my mother, not my father, not his. That's our relationship. What we do intimately, it stays with us. But if that's weak from day one, then of course the mother's going to come in, the father's going to come in, aunt or the auntie or the cousin, and this one and that one. They're going to spread lies and they're going to gossip and they're going to expose your secrets. That everyone has. Everyone has a secret. It doesn't have to be haram, but it's a secret. It's my personal life. It's none of your business. So that's the best piece of advice. It's for you and your wife to be on the same page. For you to educate her Islamically and be to tell her as a person, I don't tell your secrets, you don't tell mine. We live as husband and wife. We protect each other's honor. We got each other's back. But if it's weak, if your relationship isn't that strong, if, you, if your wife is leaning towards her mother and she doesn't understand the concept of loving you and respecting you, it's going to be what? It's going to be problems. So oftentimes you have to be strong and communicate with your wife. Talk with your wife. And if something happens that displeases you, don't keep silent about it. Talk to her about it. Don't bite her head off and, and, and snap and talk to her. That's not okay. I don't like that. Please don't do that again. Your mother, with all due respect, is not my wife. I didn't marry her. I married you. Your culture, alhamdulillah, from Palestine, I understand that. From Bangladesh, okay. From West Africa, but this is America. We're not in a village in, 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 in this country anymore. Malish. Malish. That's against Quran and Sunnah. That's against my customs. And my customs, we don't go and tell our mothers every single thing. I don't like that. Please don't do that again. I wouldn't do that to you. And if she's a good woman, and if she truly loves you, she's going to listen to you. And she's not going to do that. If she has evil with her, and she's not a good woman, she doesn't really respect you and love you, she's going to keep doing the same thing. How can you continue to do the same thing that you know it displeases me? So your relationship, you and her, that's the, that's the first thing that needs to be solidified. Everybody understand this? Needs to be what? Solidified. And the best way, or from the best ways of solidifying a relationship is what? Communication. The average husband and wife do not properly thoroughly communicate. He's angry, she's mad, but they don't know. You gotta talk. Adina nasiha. You gotta make shura. Wa amruhum shura bainum, Allah says. You have to make shura with each other. You have to talk with each other, consult each other. Honey, what do you think about? What do you think about this? She asked this. You may have your decision made already. But to show her respect and to show her that she means something, her opinion is valued, you ask her, even though you have what? You already have your opinion made up. What do you think about this, Zoj? What do you think about this, honey? Or boo, or whatever you call your wife. Huh? Whatever title or name that you have. You ask her, and she asks you. So you have to communicate in a marriage. And if something is against Kitab and Sunnah, if something makes you angry, if something is displeasing to you, you do not keep silent. Whether you find the appropriate time or the proper way, but you talk to her. And do not allow no one to interfere in your personal affairs. Abedin. Wallahu alam.